بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلاة و سلام و لا خير المرسلين محمدين النبي الأمة و على آله و صحبه أجمعين أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Well I guess this is uh, April 30th uh, 2016 well, What we want to do today is uh, carry on from what we did yesterday, inshallah. And uh, so we'll consider this as part two uh, uh, from yesterday's kutbah, inshallah. And I would just like to read an opening statement from uh, Islamic Institute of Counter-Zionist American Psychological Warfare. The headline is Design Destiny, Design Future, Design process, global transformation, the proper methods of goal attainment, and this is from the Institute, and it'll be, it was held in Oakland, October 30, 2011. Together, we must develop a plan of action and work with missionary zeal to bring about and play a role in the Earth Liberation Movement, which aims to free, which, which aims uh, to free the Earth from the parasitical behavior of man, establish a non-predatory system of interconnected global harmony nurture and further a culture of earth first custodianship understand and respect the rights of the earth which should be treated as a living organism which it is and envision and actualize uh, a global redesign for the 21st century i know that sounds like a lot but uh, today i'm going to deal with some of the general information of what we're about uh, here in Washington, D.C. and in Oakland, California. So this term uh, talked about uh, the Earth Liberation Movement to develop a process to free the Earth from the parasitical behavior of the human being. Establish a non-predatory system of interconnected global harmony. Nurture and further a culture of Earth-first custodianship. We use the word custodianship coming from uh, Khalifa. Khalifa has many, it, it means successor, that means the, the Khalifa Tul Rasul, uh, that was one of the names of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, because he couldn't be the Khalifa Tul Allah, so he, is, uh, he was following in the line of the Prophet, peace be upon him. There's another uh, the third meaning in the dictionary of Khalifa is custodian. And we get that idea when the Quran talks about that Allah is going to place a Khalifa on earth, a vicegerent as we call it in English. And that relates to a human being that would have vast authority. Now, in that aspect, we believe Khalifa carries the custodial as a custodian, like in any institution you have what we used to call a custodian. The earth needs a custodian right now. This is not only amongst Muslims, but Christians, all the religious thinking people are looking at not dominating the earth, but being a custodian of the earth, establishing a non-predatory system. Now, 
Part of our approach is what we call beautiful worldism. Uh, that we're living here in the early part of the 21st century. We have unlimited uh, possibilities as far as uh, technology and what have you. But we believe that uh, we refer to human being in a kind of a humorous way, homo erectus technocratus, you know, in, in science and anthropology and what have you. And they talk about uh, when the human being became, became homo erectus. In other words, instead of crawling around, he walked on two feet, homo erectus. In other words, he stood straight up. Well, we refer to Homo erectus technocratus. He walks standing up, but he still acts as a caveman. He's Neanderthal in his whole approach to uh, his relationship with other human beings. What we're trying to say is, can you imagine a human being? The billions and trillions of dollars we spend on weapons and destroying each other. Can you imagine any other animal, any other species, spending all of their time on not trying to help each other, but on trying to destroy each other? This is an insanity. We are ruled by people who would be, uh, who will be considered clinically insane. In fact, they are insane by their own standards. It's just that they're backed by the political uh, and economic processes in the world. So uh, we want to do away with the rule of the caveman, Neanderthal man, and bring in what we call beautiful worldism. Beautiful worldism uh, is, is, is the idea of, maybe the Greeks called it utopia, that means a good place. Uh, some literature calls it Shangri-La, mm -hmm. you know, these special places. Uh, some people just call it somewhere over the rainbow, as the song say, way up high, a land that I heard of, somewhere in an alibi, a, a, a lullaby, a, a dream place. Well, you know, we can, I believe that Allah has given the human being the ability to produce that world. He just has to get control of one element. Uh, we call it this process of cleansing is taskia bil nas. The nas, the desires, the wants, the inclination that that are in the human being. And Allah put them there for good, the desire for uh, sex, uh, for security, for longevity. All of these things to be accepted, all of these things are good, but they have to be maintained and they have to be controlled. as a, a control of the sex mechanism because if it's not checked, it would run rampant like it does in the United States <laughs> and other Western places. So we have to control our nafs, the desire for power and rule and what have you. A lot of people ask us the things which, uh, where do you get your credentials to mm -hmm. talk like this, you know? Well, uh, I don't graduate from any university or anything. In fact, uh, I have some college courses and I was a four point uh, average student when I got uh, uh, an invitation from uh, some Kappa Dapa organization to join, I stopped going to, uh, I stopped taking credits. I continued to go to school, like even in prison. I went to, uh, I took all the college courses, but I would monitor because I didn't want to let a uh, uh, classical educator. I did it on my own. I did not want a degree or certificate that I could go to anyone and get a job. <laughs> I didn't want that because I had been free all my life. I had worked for one year and I knew that if you're going to do a big mission, this is just my own personal view, 
that I could not and I did not want a job. So I made sure I couldn't get a job. I can't get a job. I can't get credit anywhere. I can't get credit. I have zero credit because I've lived all my life in cash and I don't cooperate with the system. So I don't have credit. I can't get anything. I have the worst credit rating in the world. I may donate hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years, but I don't, uh, I don't have no credit in the system. Okay, here's what I wanted to do personally. <clears throat> I have uh, some, I have a few, uh, well, I might as well show them. These are a few, uh, this is creating a new uh, civilization, of, civilization of Islam, World Conference in Pretoria, South Africa, April 7th. April 5th to April 7th, 1996. That was actually just 20 years ago. And you see here some of the greatest speakers in the world, including Dr. Yaqub Zaki from Edinburgh, Scotland, Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, which, who was our mentor in the Islamic Institute. He founded the uh, Majlis Ashur Islamiya Free Britannica, which is the Muslim Parliament. Here's uh, from September 19th, 2011. This is the front page. If you look right on the back page, it'll say, U.S. Israel cannot stop uh, uprising Imam Abu Ali Musa, which is right here. So that means people pay attention to what we say. I can go as far back as 30 years ago almost, you can see how black the hair is. I ain't got a great thing on And it says, al Haj Malik Shabazz, uh, the most honorable black leader in the U.S. This is 1989. So that's uh, almost 30 years ago, 27 years ago. Okay, so we were recognized then as participators. Here's another old one. You can tell how faded they are. This is some of the leaders at the World Conference. This is in Tehran, of course. Here we have the leader of the Shia community in Pakistan. You'll see uh, one of the leaders from Sudan and one of the, the Arab brothers. Uh, and then you'll see me. Again, not a speck of black on there. That means, that's on the front page, that means people have to be paying attention to you. This, okay, now this is recent, this is just a couple of months ago, again, from the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is a, a conference of, this is, was a lecture given, and it's front page with a whole centerfold. You see? So, what I'm saying is, my credentials do not come from a university, it comes from the Islamic movement. Uh, there's, I ain't seen nobody's picture from America with the rock bar. I have not, have you seen anybody's picture? I haven't seen anybody's picture with the rock bar, and I got others. Now, I do want to point out something about education. In many of the conferences, this is a conference uh, in 88, 1988, and it's the future of the Haramain, and it's the Sixth World Seminar, Muslim Institute in London. Now, many of the speakers, I spoke at this conference, I was one of the, uh, I participated in it, helped coordinate it a little bit even. Uh, this is London, January uh, 1988. Now, Many of the speakers write papers. They write papers. These are papers of the speakers. These are educational papers. This is the where they speak. Now this paper is the future of Haramain and emerging political power of Islam. Uh, Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, director of the Muslim Institute. Okay, then we would have 
political significance of Hajj. Uh, Yunus Mohammed, uh, Nigeria. Now, I get a chance to listen to these speakers, I get a chance to read their articles, and I get a chance to talk with them during a whole week-long seminar. Here's another one. Towards a universal outlook for the Haramein, the inalienable uh, Quranic right and a Hajj imperative. Dr. Tijani Miskeen, he's a friend of mine, University uh, of uh, Maiduguria, Maiduguria in Nigeria. Okay, Dr. Tijani Miskeen, you know Tijani, Tijania Miskeen. Uh, okay, I get a chance to talk with these brothers. I get a chance to go over how things are in their country, the history of the, and the development of the Islamic movement. So, uh, here's another. Sokoto Khalife, which we studied, uh, a West African 19th century model of state Hajj policy. Tahir uh, Muhammad, uh, Nigeria. Again, this is an article, a well-done article. Again, I get a chance to talk to these brothers. I get a chance to question them. And I get a chance to find out about what process they in. You have to remember what stage we're talking about. This is, the earliest, this is the early stages of the revival of the Islamic movement. This is 1988. Okay, we're in the uh, real, just getting our feet on the ground for this generational revival of Islamic movement in the world. Uh, civilizational role of Hajj. Uh, Dr. Rashid Moten, Bayero University, Kano, Nigeria. In other words, all of these people are Islamic workers and they're educators. All of these people. So the people say, you don't have a university education. Well, guess what? I'm speaking to university professors and they're jumping up and down about my speeches. And I'm listening to their speeches and we're sharing like mutual brothers and in some cases sisters. Okay. Uh, another, Future of Haramein. Another doctor. Tinku uh, uh, Hassan Hitiru. Again, this is uh, a valley, that means uh, the leader, of Islamic State of Achi Sumatra. Of course, that's down in, in, in the south. Uh, Aichi and Sumatra. So when we talk about uh, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, that's what we're talking about. On the future of Haramein in Mecca and Medina. Uh, I just put those things out. 1982 proceedings of uh, International Seminar began in London. Declaration, draft resolutions. We always had resolutions to give us focus for our work. Basically what I'm trying to tell you is that I gain, uh, let's not talk about uh, the time spent in Algeria uh, and East Africa uh, when we were still uh, in our formative stage, in the decolonization stage. See, all of these people from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, we could talk about them because we already had international experience on our own. We were not coming to these conferences just as uh, visitors like. This is another conference, seventh annual, seventh Islamic thought conference. Again, 
The people write uh, articles, and they have a table full of articles. You can see what I did. This is just a few I have. I went to all tables, and when I came back to America, I had boxes of every lecture. Why? Why? Because you want to learn about what other people are doing. You want to learn about, for instance, if there's Ikhwan al Muslimin and they're speaking, we want to learn from uh, uh, their experience. Okay, there are some special people that we've studied a lot of. Of course, Sokoto Khalife in what's called modern Nigeria, Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, Imam Khomeini, Sayyid Kutub, Imam Hassan al Banna. We've studied all of these people. And we take a little bit from each. Malana Maunduni, Jamaat Islami. We've studied all of these people. We don't have to reinvent the wheel here in America. <laughs> now, I'm saying this going back uh, over 30 years ago when we're in our initial stage of development. We study and have studied all the Islamic movements, their functions and how they work their per paperwork, their organization and structure. So when we formed Asaba Kun as a movement, we took those things that were relevant from all of the movements, but the last 20%, say we took 80% from everybody else, and the other 20% was our own experience right here in the U.S. to make it relevant. That's why many people are uncomfortable with us. Some of the people supported uh, people in our masjid, like Iqwani's supported Abdul Malik and those people in our masjid. They invited him to program, they invited him to speak everywhere, uh, uh, even uh, Ikna. All of them were very happy they wouldn't invite me anywhere. Uh, for what reason? I don't know. Maybe they were mistaken and they mistook people speaking about movement instead of knowing about movement mm -hmm. and being involved. Okay, technically I believe they didn't want me to speak on their programs then and now because we incorporated, we did not take wholesale anybody's program. They just stuff it down our throat and we swallow it. No, we honor what they have by reviewing it, studying it, and, uh, and you can see in some of the literature that we have some of their ideas reflected. Mm -hmm. But we have to institute activities of Islamic movement in America based on the reality on the ground here. Yeah, right, That's right. just the way it is. Right. Uh, and uh, so, uh, not to take much more time on that, but. Uh, Tablik in Islam. So this is an overseas uh, site. Uh, Zawar Hossein Zaidi. Okay, so this is his idea. I listened to his lecture. He sounds like he's from Pakistan or in that area. I listened to his lecture. I learned what they are faced with and now I'm closer to them. And these are from all over. The point I'm making is, if a university is a place where you go and you hear lectures, right, and talks and read books, well, I'm reading the first-hand books by the top people in the Islamic movement. Don't forget, in those days, it wasn't like now. If you take the Arab Spring, and if you take Tunisia, and if you take the people who went back to take charge of that situation, you will see it's Rashid Ganushi. Mm -hmm. Rashid Ganushi was in exile from Tunisia. All of, a lot of our people that we read about here were <laughs> exiled, you know, from Iraq, from different places, because they had dictators there. Okay, so we had a chance to study these people. Today, 
in modern times, many of the people that are going back to their country, many of the people who have ascended to power are all friends of ours because we were all in it together in the old days. That's why the brother uh, sent this, Brother Musa, enjoyed the tapes very much. Please send more uh, by my mother, your homeboy, from the days of the struggle, Pete O'Neill. If you go on the uh, television, they have uh, the Panther in Africa. It's a well-known public TV thing. Okay, these are friends of mine. Uh, he took over the Black Panther Party after Eldridge Cleaver stepped down in Algeria in 1972. Okay, we were friends during all of that period. So my education comes from on the ground. I know the people in the movement. I didn't read about them. You lived it. Yeah, I live it at the right, like right now. <laughs> when I go to Iran, I don't go and ask a guy, hey, what's going on? They ask me and put me on the front page of their newspaper because the talk, you got to understand what's going on. Because the talk that is given at the Western Studies Department, they're filming and everything, they say this is the best lecture we have heard on our own condition from anybody. Therefore, we'll put, it has to be halfway all right, or people will say, why you put that mess in our paper, right? right. It would have been an uproar. You had an American, uh, and our newspaper, what's wrong with you? Well, uh, two days after, I was at a hose giving a talk, and a brother talk, walked in in a black turban, and I asked well, my friend, who is that? He says, that's the Rahabah's representative. He's the governor of such and such an area or province. I say, alhamdulillah. What was he doing there? He was coming, he read the article, the Rahabah might have sent him. Because we're all on the same team. And when, you know, when you love people, you know about them. You know their birthdays, their holiday, all that stuff. So when I go to these countries, uh, I'm telling them, well, I don't want to go over there because this happened over there. Well, hey, man, if you're going to get over here, why don't you go around this way? They said, how do you know how to get around? You're a Tehrani. You're from here. I said, well, I've been here a few times. Muslim-orientated Christian mission with a case study of the Red Sea mission. Another friend of mine, Dr. Zafaru, Islam Khan, director of the Institute of Islamic and Arabic Studies, New Delhi, India. Right? Okay. What I ask the people is what type of doggone education do you think I should get if I'm dealing with the people who are on the ground uh, and the movements? Okay. This is just more uh, a decade of revolutionary Islam and a struggle to end tablik of world arrogance of the East and the West. <laughs> they mean they want to stop the, the propaganda uh, of the East and the West and the 10 year struggle. All of these, secularism and its impact on the Hajj operations in Nigeria. They're talking about secularism in their own society. What I'm trying to say is, so I won't be pestered anymore, the people who see this video will see that this is about 1% of the information that I have. Uh, and the conferences, the lectures, the international meetings and, and gatherings in order to discuss the future of the Islamic movement. We've been dealing with that for over 35 years in a specific detailed way. So that's the credentials. What have we been doing here during the movement? In America, we've been archivists, documentalists, chroniclers, historians, and we hope to be illuminators and inspirers and educators. We've been archiving 
all, just like I got all this stuff from every conference, okay, I have all of the stuff that old Sam, the mean old government, has been uh, dealing with and doing all of his time. Uh, why? Here's one right here. U.S. domestic covert operations from the archives, war at home. Uh, this is against the, the movements. What does it say? Harassment through psychological warfare. Harassment through psychological warfare. things that they did to us, bogus leaflets, pamphlets, and other publications from COINTELPRO. Bogus leaflets, letters, and pamphlets. I, I know friends of mine, like Kwame, uh, Kwame Tori, uh, and uh, Imam Jamil, that is H. Rap Brown, and, and those people, they would write letters and claim that one of them came from the other. These are friends, Stokely Carmichael and Imam Jamil. They're both friends, both come out of SNCC. When they escalated in the movement, in the Black Power movement, the government would send letters and have it intercepted. This letter here is from H. Rap Brown, and it's saying you a punk, a sissy, and all kind of stupid stuff, right? This stuff works in LA. Uh, they wrote uh, Ron Coringa a letter. He was the head of the United Slaves of America. You know, the bald-headed guy with the sunglasses. Mm -hmm. In 1969, on the campus of UC, uh, UCLA, uh, us, uh, United Slaves of America, killed four or five of our brothers in the Panther Party. Killed them dead. Why? Because the U.S. government oh, had sent uh, Letters making them think the Panthers was going to kill them. Wow. Yeah, uh, friends of mine was killed up there too. See, forged correspondence. Forged correspondence, right here. Okay. Uh, okay, now we're living this. Anonymous, anonymous letters and telephone calls. Anonymous letters and telephone calls, right at the top. Uh, pressure through employers, landlords, and others. We all know about the how much. Uh, every week I get a new, uh, a new fine or some uh, that, 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 that. Uh, tampering with mail and telephone services. Again. All of this, we at the top, we're, we're, so, we're so used to this stuff, it don't bother us. We, this stuff don't bother us for 20 years, longer than that. It don't even affect us. But we have to know it. That's, that's one of the points about the movement now in Oakland and in D.C. and leading, spreading around the world. We're the only survivors of the Islamic movement in America that's, uh, that's taking up the challenge. We have people who uh, claim that they, uh, you know, want to do big Islam, but uh, they won't even turn, return our telephone calls, so <laughs> they say they care, but when we call, they won't return, and they're supposed to be friends, they won't even return our telephone calls. All our so-called friends in the Islamic movement, no calls at all. Why? Because the government has put the word out. And basically, they may have scared our friends to death. I like that you say you're hot. <laughs> I'm hot. Yeah. And love every minute of it. Disinformation to prevent or disrupt movements, meetings, and activities. Uh, we've had people in Oakland, especially Mukhtar and Khadiji, they just walk in making noise and shouting, and uh, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures from the re revolution, I mean from the war in the south, in the swamps, this is in Huwaza. You can see this is a, an Iranian guy, he may be 16, 17, he may be as old as 18, 
You see he's in a swamp. He was walking in a swamp. You can see a uh, dead body, the foot right there. You can also see his rifle. He has to be a sniper because it's a bolt action. It's not, uh, so he has some sophistication. This lets us know, uh, now I visited the war during, the, during that period and I've seen a lot of these uh, scenes. This is why this is my favorite. They had to put up with that and they survived. And they gave uh, hope to the world. So now us, back to us. So we're archivists. That means and chroniclers, we have been keeping, we are keepers of the history of the Islamic movement in the last 35 years. And that's our duty, that's our responsibility. We've been very good at keeping our own history in writings, in lectures, and in programs, and even flyers. The flyers let you know uh, what was going on. You know, you have certain flyers, and the flyer itself will tell you what was going on. So we have here the Great Recovery, you know what I mean? Uh, that being that we're just getting ready to recover. Uh, here's a couple of flyers. The flyer, our flyers are educational themselves. Global strategy for Islam. Global strategy for Islam. That means that evidently uh, we're thinking about a world above and beyond. Now you got to remember how we opened it. We want to establish a global system of interconnected activity to move man toward non-parasitical behavior where he won't be a parasite. Mm. You see what I mean? So, now, evidently, I have letters from the Zionists too. The big Zionists, Abe Foxman is the biggest Zionist in America. Uh, okay, Steve Emerson, people know about him, Daniel Pipes. Now this right here is from the internet. It says, revolution from Egypt to the Americas. That's what it says. Uh, this is not my flyer. It says, Oakland and the Islamic Revolution. So the system knows there's something going on in Oakland. This is what they're saying. Then they have Oakland and the Islamic Revolution. Imam Jamil Alameen, H. Rap Brown, in prison for the rest of his life, unless we can get busy, inshallah, and help get him. Imam Luqman, killed in Detroit in 2009, right? Then they have my picture, Imam Abdul Ali. Why would they have it hooked up like this? Why is this like this? Who put this on the internet? Hmm. You know, why did they put it there, okay? What revolution from Egypt to the Americas? Why do they have Oakland and the Islamic Revolution? What's going on in Oakland <laughs> that they want their friends to know about? Therefore, when we run into some fitness, some challenges, some obstacles in Oakland, we consider them natural. Why? Because what they see and what they know is that we have chose Oakland, California to be the seat of the Islamic revival in America. That's our choice. Okay. But we, have, we didn't say it till a couple of years ago. They said it five years ago. Mm. Why? Because we're talking about it and we're structuring. We're, we're engineering the environment right? For that to happen, inshallah. So we have been, we want to be illuminators of the movement. We're already chroniclers, historians, and archivists. And, uh, people always come to us with this thing about you're very, you have a lot of audacity, audacity. You really, 
think you're somebody, don't you? I said, no. I said, of course, yeah, well, you don't get me wrong. Of course we think we're somebody. Everybody should think they're somebody. Well, don't you know how hard that is? I said, it's hard for you. <laughs> it's not hard for me because once, we talked about tough weed before. Tough weed is delegation. When you delegate your everything that you are in the presence of to a lot, you turn it over to a lot. It's like Tawaka. And then Ritter is uh, being pleased with what Allah gives you. I wanted to play a part since I was younger in the human historical process. Earth liberation movement. I wanted to. Allah sent me through this gangsterism and all that stuff and colonialism to learn. So, I think I, I have more earthly experience than anybody I know, any congressperson, any of the movement people, because even the movement people, they've been maybe in a certain place with a certain group. I've been everywhere with everybody. I've been transporting drugs in South America, other times from Mexico. I've been in Denmark and Sweden. Uh, when the many of our people ran away from America, you could go to Denmark and Sweden, you know what I mean? Uh, I've been all over Europe. I've been, I have had associate, you can see the program from South Africa, from the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement from decades and decades ago when there was no real possibility. All of our friends are evolving. All of our enemies are weaker. In the old days, the U.S. was big and strong and they couldn't do no wrong. That's I'm not trying to rhyme, that's just the way it <laughs> It's not like that anymore. In the old days, didn't nobody accept us. We knew each other only. Other people didn't want to hear about us. They didn't want to and they didn't want you coming to their masjid and talking about all that rebellion, all that stuff. That's different now. Any masjid you go to, the people are quiet and they're afraid, but they know what's going on in their country. And eventually, uh, they will open up. So, we're pleased with what Allah gave us. We're not... Uh, I, I, I like one motivator said this, we don't got to do this, we get to do this. <laughs> you see what I mean? We don't have to do what we're doing. We get to do it. Okay. So, uh, that back to that idea about uh, somewhere over the rainbow. Dreamland. Eloquence, resistance to the darkness and backwardness. And that's what we want to do. We, we're resisting going back. We're not going to, inshallah, allow people to take us back to old times, ancient times, and old issues. We're not going to let anybody start fights with us or anything. We're not going to fight any pawns. Mukhtar, <laughs> Abdul Malik, them are pawns. And when they insult us, in front of the public, they're doing what we want them to do. And I'll tell you later on how we engineered it. But this is gonna take things like willpower, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we're talking in human terms. You turned it over to Allah, you trust in Allah, you're well pleased with Allah, but there are certain habits you have to have too. Willpower, fortitude, endurance, relentlessness. Mm -hmm. You know, the Quran mentions in one place that shaitan is a relentless enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's a persistent it's enemy. enemy. Yeah. Now stop. Shaitan, that's right, he don't. So if you're going to jump on that boy, 
you, he's doing persistent evil. You have to do persistent good. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, tenacity, constancy, perseverance, purposefulness. In fact, if we gave out awards for what we do, we would give ourselves a resistance award. There you go. Yeah, because we've resisted the United States government, the Zionists, and our own people for decades. Eh? Not a scratch, so it's being like almost unbreakable. Even Gallup, and I know they don't use that word for <laughs> Negro, but we use it for ourselves. Uh, I use that word in one case I was thinking about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah. You know, when you read the history, even they show it in movies. Mm -hmm. These guys, when they escorted those B-17s over Germany, they never lost one bomber during the whole war. That's incredible. <laughs> Who ever heard of what? <laughs> You know, they did bombing missions once and twice a day in those days, you know. They never lost one B-17. Mm. Nobody even has anything like that as a record. And uh, once when they was organizing the bombing strikes, one of the white captains said, uh, I want the boys, uh, the, the black boys. So you want them on purpose? Said, yeah. He said, they've never lost. So them white men had enough sense to know, hey, you want to get back? Get with the brothers. Right. Hey, can you imagine that, the, that the comfort of knowing you're going to go out and you could get shot out of the air and all kind of stuff, but if you if the Negroes are with you, you're, okay. you're going to come back. <laughs> hey, man, <Security>. who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> That's gallantry. They don't call our people gallant. They don't call, they don't use it. They save them for themselves. If they're lucky. Yeah, strategic <laughs> counteroffensive. The greatest epic in modern history. What's going on in Oakland? The white folks know it, the Negroes just don't know. I'm not being arrogant. The Islamic revival is starting in Oakland, whether they like it or not. Now, this is uh, bravado here. This is uh, so that when people see it, they will say, can you look at the arrogance of that nigga there? <laughs> well, that's what we want. We want to do like how to punk the FBI. How to punk the FBI was done for a reason. That if we have this program, How to Punk the FBI, this was almost 10 years ago, 2007, nine years ago. Wow. And we don't get killed or we don't get put in jail. Everybody will say, hey man, look at that, buddy. We're afraid of the FBI and this guy that called them sissies and you know stuff. Then we come back in 2009, repunk the FBI. Repunk the FBI. Well, it's worse this time. You know why? We have survived this last round with the government. Mm -hmm. Everything that they can throw at you all at one time. It wasn't just harassment. It wasn't just bringing guns to the masjid and uh, pulling out guns, pointing guns at us. It wasn't just being arrested in the masjid that you have a deed and it has your name on it for Masjid al Islam. It's right there. But they take you to jail and Mukhtar is holding the hand of the police. Uh, Mukhtar shot dogs. They messed up my flattened the tires of the van and I had to move it down to the school and they, I had my son bring his, the old mean dogs, whatever they call them. Pit bulls. Pit bulls. Yeah. Mukhtar goes down and shoots the dogs while we're in Juma. It's okay. They can do, look, 
those Negroes, and the government can do anything to me they want to. I'm telling you, they, they, it only, they didn't just go into the account and give the money to Mukhtar. Mukhtar didn't have me put in jail and tried to do it again. Mukhtar, did, did, he could do anything he want. But here's what they, they want me to kill that Negro. That's what they want. And then they send people. Of course it backfires. Here's what happened. People come to me, hey man, I'm still taking care of 187s. 187 is, you know, murder in California. Because <laughs> see, people in Oakland are watching that stuff. And they telling me, if you don't want to do it, I got it covered. We got that covered. Who is, what is wrong? Because see, this stuff has never happened. And it's insanity. Right. Okay? But we wanted that to happen. It's more than what we wanted. Now people can see what we deal with. And not a scratch on us. We're not angry about it. And we're smiling. And everybody is on our team. And they can't justify anything. Right? Why did you call the police to have Imam put in jail and he brought to the masjid before? You was just born a couple of years old when they bought it. Well, why, you know, all of that stuff, right? I'm trying to tell you, this is uh, because Oakland's history, I'll put it that way, not only the Black Panther Party, but if you saw those movies, the Mac and all of those movies, mm -hmm. they were in Oakland, that's Oakland. All those people in the movie, except the stars, were Oaklanders. They was all the people, a lot of the people you see, they was from Oakland. Okay, they all of them were friends of mine. So the biggest hustlers and gangsters on the West Coast was not LA. LA is 10 times bigger though. Mm -hmm. Why little Oakland? 400,000 people. Oakland has that character. It's, Small place. Why is the Black Panther Party headquartered in Oakland? Why is it not New York or LA? Why is it this, uh, a town not big as DC? Why does it come from there? Because Oakland has a history. Oakland has a character. Oakland has a lot going for itself. So they killed and destroyed a lot of the black movement in Oakland. So we ask Allah to allow the Islamic movement, which comes after remember, civil rights, black power, black nationalism, black liberation, Islam. Those people that were eliminated before they even had a chance to come to Islam. Oh Allah, let us uh, bring the Islamic uh, movement back to life. And you can see it's coming. Everybody's waking up right now from Oakland. That's, that's what we're doing. That's why we've been there uh, taking care of business. That's why nobody can do nothing but aid and assist. They can't harm us and they can't hurt us in any way whatsoever. Uh, you know, uh, I was watching a movie uh, last year called The Martian. You know, about the, the guy that was Mars. stranded on Mars. Yeah, yeah. Matt Damon. Yeah, that was a good movie. It was, it was. The last part I liked better than any other. He was teaching a class and he told the kids, you keep solving problems one after another until you get back home or something. You, right. Uh, until you make it. Mm -hmm. He said, you are out there and you say, you are going to die. So a very good chance. But you keep solving one problem after another till you get back home. This is the way we feel about the Islamic movement. They're not problems, they're challenges, they're opportunities, and they're obstacles. And the higher the obstacle, the higher, the better trained you have to get to get over the obstacles. We love obstacles. 
uh, we're going to end this in one hour. It's another six, seven minutes. Here's what we do. The eyes of the world is on our Sabaku, Masjid al-Islam. It's not only in the Crescent and newspapers, but uh, the voice of the Cape uh, is in Iranian papers. It's on press TV. The whole world <laughs> has seen. Their goal was to isolate us, to cut us off in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And at those times, I would act isolated. I, would, I wouldn't go see anybody or anything. So they could put everybody, everything they got in place except the psychological guerrilla warfare, I was drawing them in. Pretty soon, they continued to expose themselves more and more <laughs> and more. Now the whole world know who they are. And guess what? The world is on our side. We have people, wherever we go in the world, people are praying for us, and you could tell, because I'm telling you, it ain't a scratch good English, that is not or is not how they, ain't no scratch on nobody. <laughs> no psychological, you know what I mean, looking all around, paranoia, nothing. No paranoia. Man, uh, <laughs> in fact, I don't want to talk about it much, but I think uh, this has produced a high level spiritual experience. Because you have to evolve a long way to not respond to those types of things. Right, right. Hey, man, uh, all we can do is, uh, is, is think a lot. Amen. So, as our letter opened up, we want to influence the direction of change. Global redesign for the 21st century. And we want to have a bigger opportunity of acting on the world stage. This is not a, a historical racism or anything, but the element is like this. Black people are appreciated all over the world a lot more. Can you imagine how popular Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and those people are? Our rappers, singers, everything. Mm -hmm. People like black people. People have an idea of what we've been through. They are amazed. You can make jazz music, and you can make those optimistic songs when you guys are getting burned and lynched. Good God, it is, it's remarkable. <laughs> it's, amen. You guys are happy to say, I want to tell you one incident, this is true, it's really, when I was at Lum Park Camp, most of the black people came from inside the wall, like, uh, or from Leavenworth to somewhere, a prison, big prison. Then they went out to camp before they went home. The big white people, the bankers and all those people, they went straight to camp. In fact, sometime the FBI would call them and say, we want you to come down and uh, check in that the FBI or right, to right. jail. And then you sign out, they let you go. Then you go to court and they sentence you to two years at camp. And your wife drives you up to the camp in a Winnebago or something. Mm. And she stays around a week, and you can sneak off to camp and go to your Winnebago. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, one of the, the white boys came in. He was in the barbershop. We was all in the barbershop. And there was, a, of course, one white barber there, or one person that was uh, getting ready to see the white barber. So, Oh, you're new here. Yeah, I just came in, and I came right and turned myself in. And the other one said, yes, I've never had a pair of handcuffs on in my life, you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they realized that Nicholas was looking like, <laughs> what? You have never been arrested. You are a convicted felon. You're in a federal prison camp. Yeah, You've never had handcuffs on. 
all the Negroes got leg irons and shackles, man. Wow. So what I'm trying to say is, one of the white boys I worked out with a little bit, and he was a rich upper class. In fact, I used to have a class at Lombard Camp after count four o'clock. Because I, I, I conversed with all the big rich people there. I actually had them came, come to speak at our Muslim programs on everything, on banking, on uh, hypnosis. They had doctors there and did, uh, they hypnotized the group. Uh, the effect of hypnosis was a friend of mine. He was a Christian actor. <laughs> and we worked out together. You know. So, They, uh, they would come and they would speak and they was missing an element. What they wanted to know is, how can you guys be on the weight pile laughing and talking and jumping up and down? And you guys got 20 year sentences. You right. come to camp on the end of your sentence and y'all just jumping up and down and carrying on. I have one year. And, I, and I'm going to, uh, two years, and I'm going to do only 18 months of work. And I stole $2 million, and you guys, you know, they just wanted to know. I said, well, I had to tell them why we were accustomed to prison. Mm -hmm. we, it's part of our culture. <laughs> You're not accustomed to prison. It's not part of your culture. When we come to prison, it's like going to the university or we... It's common. Like your kids go to the university, our kids go to prison. And we, you take that as normal. Wow. And when you are arrested and go to jail, your friends consider you a loser. You are part of the system. You're white. You're big time. And you are a loser. You're ashamed of yourself, aren't you? Yes. I said, I'm not ashamed of being in jail. Now everybody go to jail. We're accustomed to it. It's natural. That's why we do time. We can do uh, five years easier than you can do one because it's part of our culture. It's like you do time, but you don't let time do you. Heck no, I don't do it. So all I did was study. I came out to a good man. Okay. We would like to close this one, uh, and I would close this one by just saying that uh, part of our process right now from Oakland is not just arguing with Negroes there. This is not, uh, that is not what we are about. We want to be a part of influence the direction of change, global redesign for the 21st century, we want to see the human being make a better world that's worth living in. Thank you very much.